by demonstrating our interdependence. You know, brothers and sisters, as independent Baptist churches, we are not ashamed of that. That's something for us to be proud about. But we also recognize that we are part of a body of believers who believe the same thing. And we are interdependent. We need one another. God intended us to work together. And, and, and this is what you do when you do missions. You partner with brothers and sisters all across the road, all over the world. When we get to heaven, it's going to be a hallelujah time. As, as we get together and glory in God. So why not let's just start it here. Let's support one another. And thank you for standing by us and the many missionaries that you have stood by for all these years. You know, we, we also, I also am involved in something else. I serve at the Fairview Baptist Bible College in Jamaica. I've been serving there for the past 10 years as an instructor at the school, but also I serve for a short time as, as the academic dean. But that was just getting just too much for me because my major responsibility, I believe, is towards our local church. And so I had to cut back, but I still serve at the Bible College as an instructor. My third ministry that I want to share with you about is our, our local church. And what better way to do that more than to just let that slide run and I'll walk you through some of the things here. You know, when I came here first many years ago, we met in a termite infested little room. There were just a handful of people there. When it rained on the outside, it poured on the inside. You remember that story I told you? You know, because that's, that's a reality. That's how it was. We came and some of you guys from the US here stood beside us. But above all, God was with us and he still is. You know, the Lord had helped us to be able, with the help of missionaries and friends, to build um, a building where we do worship, the church worship. Darlison community, approximately 2,700 people live in its environs. The community of Darlison is a hub for a number of smaller communities. It's Darlison and its environs. There are schools that I minister in, and, uh, you know, women and children account for approximately 85 um, percent of those who attend. You need to pray for men. Stand with us. Because the devil, if he can get the man, he'll hold the family. But if we can focus and pray, you know, deliberately and purposefully that God save men, pray for us. Because this is where our battle also is. You know, the gospel has the ability to transcend culture. Uh, we might not necessarily sing like you all the way. We sing some of the same songs. My heart was just bubbling as you sang because many of the songs that you sing here, we sing. But as a culture, we, the gospel transcends culture. And so we worship God sometimes within our culture the way we are as a people. But this is our, our town square. And uh, um, as you can see, there's a pothole in the road there. You know, that's one of our national treasures. You know, um, I know your pastor is a doctor. I haven't, I haven't tried for my doctorate yet, but I think I have it. Um, I have a PhD in a pothole dodging. <laughs> Um, some guys coming to church, arriving for church, uh, greeting time. We greet. Y you know, we greet. We, you know, when the worship with God is right, uh, that's horizontal, right? Uh, vertical. W when the relationship between us and God is right, we can't help but to have the fellowship horizontal between people, right? And that's so scriptural. You know, if you know, really know God, you know, we, we greet each other. We also facilitate people in the communities. These are farmers who came and uh, we allowed them to come sit and they had their seminar. But before they did, I make, made sure that I stood up and I presented the word. We get an opportunity. Every time somebody asks, can we, you know, your, use your building to, 
to have a seminar. I want to know what kind of seminar and so on. But afterwards, I say, hey, listen, if you're going to come, if we approve the first part, understand that I want to give a devotional first and I want to present the gospel to them. And that's, that's a great way of even planting the seed or even watering the seed. We may never know. We have baby dedications because we believe that we should commit our children to the Lord. We don't baptize babies. That's when they are old enough and they understand and get saved after salvation, baptism. That's what we practice. Oh, and that's a baptismal service there. Um, one more um, or a few more. Okay. Uh, do we have any sound? Could just we have any sound? I want to I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All those who are saved, we seek to baptize. Pray for us because there are some people who profess faith in Christ but are not yet baptized. I don't know what they're waiting for. Right. Baptism doesn't save you. It's faith in Jesus Christ that does. Right. Baptism is a public declaration of the inward work of grace that Christ has done in your heart. Yeah. That we also have weddings at our church and um, see our members getting married, they trust Christ. You know that yellow banner there, it's a sign that says, our God is able to do the impossible. And that has been there from we have um, dedicated the church because we know in spite of how difficult things are, God is able to do the impossible. Um, our kids church, children um, at one of our classes, Sunday school classes, some of our young people, um, these are just classes that we have. Um, at VBS, I hear. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Vacation Bible School, great time. Great time of fun, communicating the word to children. Um, great time. You know, I get to dress up sometimes as I present the word, and the children love it. We are giving them the word of God that is able to change their lives. But they also have fun at VBS. We conduct our own vacation Bible school. We train our young people, and our people, all our people get involved. Um, these are some of the young people who are trying to reach with the gospel. They are lost, and they won't come unless you know, we reach out to them. And we try to reach them with the gospel. When they come, they get the word. Yes, some more for young people here. Some of these youngsters' faces of some of the children. I go into schools and I do ministry, devotional exercises. And there are a few pictures with those. There are different schools that I've been to. Um, some of our young people getting excited at a youth fellowship, outdoors, ready to roll. You know, there's great things that God can do with young people as we try to reach them with the gospel. And some of our women, it's amazing how God saved people. But when you get saved, we want to ensure that we get you plugged in to do something. You know, it's not just about being saved, sitting and getting sore, but being saved and getting involved, serving. Um, Operation Christmas Tree received some gifts, and some of these kids have never received, you know, a box of gifts for themselves. So we appreciate the, the donation from Operation Christmas Tree, and we're able to um, see many of these children go home happy, but we give them the gospel first. And here, some of the students at Fairview by Baptist Bible College, and a few teachers, one of our classrooms. And this is my family. Amen. My wife and our three children. When I came here, our first daughter was just a baby, um, but since then we have grown a little. <laughs> and. I just want to end with this plea. 
Will it play? All right, if it doesn't play, that's fine. Oh, yes. You know, this was at the end of the year. I did a series last year on the church. And I reserved the last message for our banquet night. And we had uh, people coming out and just fellowshipping, relaxing a little, eating a meal together, um, sharing testimonies of what God has done, and, uh, um, and just re -act, uh, you know, acting out the, some of the Bible stories that were there. And we had just a great time with the word and as it presented to them. Some of the faces of our um, people at church. Happy because Jesus Christ has made a difference in their lives. Okay. Thank you for standing with us. Stand, thank you for, you know, just being there um, praying us through. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Amen. Uh, do I preach now? Or pastors coming back? No, you can just you can start. I can start. <laughs> All right. Okay. You know, a few years ago I, I read a story. Well, really it's an account of a lady who had one son. And this son had a friend. And they went out together one night. And there were some differences that they had. And this lady's son was killed by his own friend. That is tragic. You know, the thing about this account is that this woman was a Christian. How is she going to deal with this? To have somebody that, that you know take the life of someone that you love. That's painful. She struggled for a long time with this. But each time she went before the Lord, she realized that the Lord wanted her to do something. To forgive. That was hard. She struggled for many months. But finally, she submitted to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and to the word of God that she knew well. She let it go, all go, forgave the guy, and to demonstrate that she forgave her son's murderer, she said, okay, Lord, I'm going to go to the prison where he is, and I'm going to show him love. To many people, she was a fool. How could somebody who have done you so much evil, you decide that you will turn around and forgive them? But she listened to a higher calling, our God. His word. And she continued to visit the young man in prison. She let him know that she forgave him. And at the end of the 18 years, just imagine, this is not a makeup story, this is a real account. When he was allowed to go to leave the prison, she signed for him. She invited him to come and live next door to her. You know, brothers and sisters, she loved that guy just as if it was her own son. You know, this shouldn't be strange to us because what she did is what I want to talk about. What she did is what this message is about tonight. I want to speak to you on the topic, Undeserved.
kindness. That's what we call grace. In fact, I must tell you that that's what missions is all about. Making known what the grace of God looks like in our lives. It's not just talking about it. It's living it. And it's hard. This is not something that you'll be able to do by yourself, but it is something that you and I are able to do because we have experienced grace. We stand as a result of the grace of God. And having experienced grace, we are the best ones to show it. But you and I, even though we have experienced it, will not really show it unless we learn to depend on God. For we'll find that it's not in our own strength, but in the strength of the one who saved us. One person said, when a person works an eight-hour day's day and received a fair day's pay for his time, we call that a wage. When a person competes with an opponent and receives a trophy for his performance, that is what we refer to as a prize. When a person receives appropriate recognition for his long service or high achievement, we refer to that as an award. And, and I hear Pastor Alquist talks about awarding some men who are in the ministry. It's great that you can see the achievement of people and cheering them on. But when a person is not capable of earning a wage, can win no prize, or deserve no award, yet receive such a gift anyway, that is what we call grace. This church is built on the idea of the grace of God. Amen. We must live it. And that's a good picture of God's unmerited favor, undeserved favor. That's what we mean when we talk about grace. I want you to hasten on and turn your Bibles with me to an Old Testament book where this truth is there staring us in the face. Deuteronomy chapter 9. And for the sake of time, we won't read all of it at once, but we'll, we'll go through. Just I would like you to get a, a good picture of what is there, but um, for the sake of time, we'll, we'll just read. First, we'll read the first three verses, and then we'll work ourselves through um, this passage of Scripture. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 9. Verse, let's read from verse 1 to 3 first. Reading. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven, a people great and tall, and children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest, and of whom thou hast heard say, Who can stand before the children of Enoch? Understand therefore this day, that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire. He will destroy them, and he shall bring them down before thy face. So shall thou drive them out and destroy them quickly. As the Lord had said unto thee. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you for you, the reading of your word and what pertains in the rest of this passage. Thank you, Lord, for the favor that you have given to us that we do not deserve. Thank you for your word that teaches us and corrects us and guides us. I pray even now that you empower me with the power of your Holy Spirit, that I will speak with clarity. 
But I pray also, Lord, that you by your spirit will come and move among us as your word um, is explained and, and outlined, that you will move by way of your word and speak to the hearts, address the issues, address the needs in the lives of your people, cause that they will be edified. I pray, oh God, if there are any here who are not saved, that under the sound of your word, your Holy Spirit will speak to them and draw them to himself. For salvation we wait upon you and i need your help lord to speak your word in jesus name amen undeserved kindness that's god's grace you know friends sometimes we fool ourselves about why we stand why we achieve why we're still here and doing well why we're believers and Christians and standing sometimes we can fool ourselves but I want to say don't fool yourself you stand because of the grace of God you and I stand because of the grace of God I want you to fully understand what the grace of God has brought to undeserved sinners and observe quickly three reasons why we shouldn't fool ourselves. The first reason why you should not fool yourselves is because the scripture outlines to us that victories and, and achievements come from God Amen. through his undeserved kindness. Deuteronomy 9 verse 1 to 3. The first three verses of Deuteronomy chapter 9 gives an overview that the victories and achievements that we may or will experience in, 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 in our lives, that they come from God. However, he, God often includes you and I, in the, or you and me, in the outworking of such victories and achievements. It's not because... We are good, so good. But it's all because God, sovereign God, allows us because he could have used others. Amen? amen. Do you say amen here still? Amen. amen. If it's true, say amen. 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 So this truth is, truth is born out in Deuteronomy 9 verse 1 and 2 when it shows us that Great challenges will stand in the way of God's people. That's what is outlined in verse 1 and 2. God says you must overcome these challenges to become victorious or to achieve. He said, hey, listen to me, Israel, you are going to pass over Jordan. That's a challenge. Jordan stood in their way to go into the promised land. The promised land speaks of, of the place of victory. And they had walked and wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and they were now on the brink of the, the promised land, just about to go in. But there was an obstacle there before them. There was a challenge in their way. It was Jordan. But God says, thou art to pass over this Jordan this day to go in and possess nations greater and mightier than yourselves, cities great and fenced up to heaven, a people great and tall, the children of Anakins, whom thou knowest, and of whom thou sayest, who can stand before the children of Anak? Notice what God says. He says, understand therefore this day that the Lord, thy God is he which goeth over before thee. As a consuming fire, he shall destroy them. He shall bring them down before thy face. He'll drive them out for you. Great challenges stand before God's people. Israel had to overcome the challenge of going over Jordan, even though God was going to do a thing for them. For, for them. You and I will have to make the effort you and I will have to put, you and I will have to put the effort in what God has called us to do. The challenge may be before us, but yet he has called us because it's possible for he's there, he's on our side. We had a challenge before us in Darleston many years ago to build a building, um, to house the church. 
to do our ministry, to work through, to reach our community. Because we are despised, we are in a little old place, an old building, termite infested. When it rained on the outside, it, it, it flowed on the inside. And that was a challenge, but by faith, we took that step of faith and we went ahead and we saw God worked great things for us. So we have that sign in our church that says, our God is able to do the impossible. Constant reminder. The first challenge to pass over Jordan. The second challenge in verse 1 was to take over cities and nations greater than Israel, the Israelites were. The third challenge God said they would face it is that they would have to overthrow the giants. Brothers and sisters at Grace of Calvary, there is no victory without a struggle. There is no victory without a battle. You want a Christianity that you will sit at ease in Zion and, and grow in grace? You're going to have some struggles. No ease in Zion, but we know we have God with us, and he'll help us. But there was also great challenges can be overcome with God's help, and that is outlined in verse 3. God's people must remember that when whatever God purpose or promise, he will perform. God said, understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee. He's going before you. Whatever he promises, he will perform. People must understand that they achieve only because the Lord allowed them to. Psalm 75, verse 5 to 7, supports his first reason that victories and achievement come from God through his undeserved kindness when it says, Lift not up your horn on high, Speak not with a stiff neck, for promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is a judge. He put it down one and set it up another. Listen to Psalm 127 verse 1, which also says, Except the Lord build a house. They labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wake it, but in vain. And again, Daniel chapter 2, verse 21 tell, declares this truth about God when it says, And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and he setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom, wisdom to the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. It's all God. So friends, it is the divine work of God when you and I are able to accomplish or experience any great achievement or victories in our lives, in the ministry, as we have done in Darleston, reaching out and still reaching out. There's a generation that we must reach. It's a younger generation and I must say that I hardly know them. We've reached some of the older people, but what we find is that the younger generation, they're set in their ways. They are far different from the generation that was before them. But we have God. Amen. God gives victories and achievement, but he often includes us in the outworking of such. So don't be fooled or don't fool yourself about your success if you have had any. Understand that it's because of God's undeserved kindness. Secondly, the second reason why you should not fool yourself is because God can fulfill his plans without you. But for his undeserved kindness. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 4 and 5 tells us, God says, Speak not thou in thine heart, after that the Lord thy God has cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord has brought me into, in to possess this land. But it's for the wickedness of these nations the Lord has 
drive them out from before thee. Not for the, thy righteousness, nor for thy, the uprightness of thine heart, dost thou go to possess, in to possess their lands. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph. These two verses gives us a warning. Don't mistakenly think that your righteousness is the reason God allows you to inherit the blessings. God could do it without you. What was special about Israel Really nothing but that God chose them. It wouldn't be grace if they were special and God therefore, I'll have to choose Israel. No, he did it of his own volition. What is special about you? Why Jesus saves you? It's not because you were good. But while we were steep in our sins, Christ died for us. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is a message we need to get out there to the people. For some people think that they have to be good enough before Jesus can make a difference in their lives. No, come with your warts and all. He'll bring about the change because he has the ability to bring about that change. It was, because, it was because of the wickedness of others, verse 4 says. It was because God was faithful to his promise. In verse 5, God says, because I made some promises to Abraham and to Isaac. I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to keep my end of the bargain. That's why you have succeeded. You know, there's something that is, is really amazing about grace, but there's something that is frightening also about the people who have received grace. We receive the grace of God, but yet we are not willing to give it many times. We, we are like takers. And we forget that we were beggars. I praise God that when I begged him for salvation, he was ready to give it to me. It wasn't because I was deserving. I was needy. Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They don't deserve the repentance, but that's grace. Undeserved favor. I am lavishing on them my mercy, my goodness, my forgiveness, my help. I'm pouring out on them. I'm pouring into them because I love them. That's the grace of God. The third reason why we should not fool ourselves is because God sees you as you really are. Amen. Not as you think you are. It's because of his undeserved kindness. He loves us. And forgives us and helps us. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 6 through to 13 bears this out for us. When it says, understand therefore. As Moses outlined to Israel, God's mouthpiece. Understand that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness. For thou art a stiff-necked people. Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until you come into this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Also in Horeb, you provoke the Lord to wrath so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. 
When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tablets of stone, Moses said, even the tablets of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. And the Lord delivered unto me two tablets of stones written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord thy God, the Lord spoke with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of the 40 days and 40 nights that the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, even the tablets of the covenant. And the Lord said unto me, Arise, get thee down quickly from hence. For the people which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molted image. Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. God sees you as you really are, not as you think you are. You know, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7 declares, For the Lord see it not as man see it, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. You know, I tell some folks that it's hard to live a double life. We can dress up, we can speak well, we can put on the church face. But if you're living a double life, you have a miserable existence. Right. For God sees you. You can hide. In Jamaica, we say you can hide from man, but you cannot hide from God. Right. For he sees us. He's going to be our ultimate judge. He's going to judge our intentions, our motives. Amen. He knows everything about us, even the things that we hide away. In one of our school devotion, I tell the children this verse from Proverbs that says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. It means that even when you're under the bed, the Lord is seeing you. Even if you steal things and go underneath, he knows. For he sees us where we are. Brothers and sisters, God both reveals and builds character through trials and testings. What is it that God revealed about Israel in these verses? First of all, God said they were stiff naked. In other words, they were stubborn. <laughs> Verse 6 says it will understand that the Lord thy God has given thee this good land, for thou art, even though thou art a stiff naked people. That's not a nice testimony to have. God said it again in verse 13. Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. These verses outline that they were proud. Stiff-necked, proud, stubborn, bent to do what they wanted to do. This is because they often refuse to do what God revealed was his command for their lives. Pastor, you can talk, but you won't move me. We're only mouthpieces. Pastor Alquis is only a mouthpiece. You're the pastor and the deacons are only mouthpieces. It's God's word that we bear. We're messengers of his word. If we handle it faithfully. God said that they were, that they provoked him in verse 7. Can you imagine people provoking God? I wonder if there are any persons in this church who is provoking God. I wonder. God said they provoked him in verse 7a when he said, remember and, and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness. Look at verse 8. Verse 80. Also in Horeb, you provoke the Lord to wrath. 
So that God was angry in verse 8. But in verse 22, we also see this when, when it says, and at Tabirath, and at Massa, and in Kebrothrohatava, he provoked the Lord to wrath. They provoked, they provoked God. They were constantly complaining about every challenge God placed before them. They also incite other members of the congregation of Israel to rebel against God many times. You know, we need to understand what God is doing and go in the direction that he's going instead of standing against him. You know, sometimes what God is doing may cost you your pride. For, for this whole walk and this whole service that we're called to is, is one where God requires us to learn to be humble. It, it's, it's about serving one another. Helping one another. Jesus demonstrated that when he got a, a, a basin of water after the disciples came in and, and it was time to wash the feet. There were no servants there to wash anybody's feet. All the disciples went and sat down. They wanted to be served. Jesus girded himself with, with a towel, got a basin and started to wash his disciples' feet. What a lesson. I've been your master and lord. It's showing you what service is about. It's not about for men to say, oh, you're a great leader. <laughs> Greatness in God's eyes and in the kingdom of God comes through servantness, through humility and, and service right. to others. And that's what God wants for us. So sometimes the challenges that God places before us is to help to mold us to become more like his son, Jesus Christ. And we rebel against it. Understand God sees you as you really are, not as you think you are. God sees the Israel were rebellious. And the accounts in these verses highlighted, um, highlights and shows us that they were rebellious because they fought against what God wanted for them. There are a lot of really rebellious people out there who are resisting the gospel. But as servants of God, we can't give up. You as a church, continue to stand with the servants of God as they go with the gospel. That's, that's what it means to, to beam your light beyond your own shores. Where you can't go, your, your finances may be able to go, go. To beam your light beyond your shores. You know, God is a faithful God. He'll reward us when we stand before him. Amen. Amen. And those who misuse God's <coughs> funds and the monies that his people faithfully give, God will reward them accordingly. Mm -hmm. None of us gets away, for he sees us as we really are, not as we think we are. In conclusion, the question is, how does God see you? And what does he say about you? Mm. You know, do you understand that it's the grace of God where you stand? Observe that it's because of God's undeserved kindness that Israel, and by extension, you and I can achieve or be victorious in our lives. We neither have the strength, ability, or opportunity to do well without God sustaining and helping us. If he does not keep us safe, we are doomed to failure. If he does not allow us the opportunity, we will never get ahead. He's a sovereign God. We praise God for the statement from Jeremiah in Lamentation chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. If it, it is of the Lord's mercies, that we are not consumed. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, 
Thank you, Lord. <laughs> because if I was, I'm your preacher tonight, right? But if I was depending on my goodness and my faithfulness to God, I'd, sorry, Pastor, but I dare not stand. I stand on account of the grace of God. And this is a grace that, will, that we present to people, what God is able to do. And if we can experience such grace, why not give it? Right. It's not ours. Only ours to give. Yes. To let it be known to others that God is able. Because of God's undeserved kindness or his grace, this is why we can get ahead. This is the same undeserved kindness that is reserved for sinners who will come to know the salvation. This is what we preach. Amen. This is what we teach. This is what we seek to live. Like that woman who lived what she believed. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray the intent for, for which you have placed this on my heart, that, Lord, your purpose will be achieved. I commit this church to you. I commit each person to you. Do that which your Holy Spirit starts to do. Draw to yourself those who are not yet saved. Edify your people. Thy will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to turn to number 493. And it's a good hymn for this particular message. I'll live for him. What is it that God's trying to do in your life? What changes is he trying to make? Where does he want to use you? Why don't you come tonight and come before the Lord and say, Lord, I, I needed to hear some of that, but I need to do and be some of that. You feel free to come. If you have any questions about going to heaven, you're not sure you're saved, tonight's the night to find out. Tonight's the night to nail it down. And why don't you come and meet me at the front and we'd be glad to help you with that. As we sing, number 400, uh, 493, you respond as... My life, my love, I give to thee, the Lamb of God who died for me. Oh, may I ever faithful be, my Savior and my God. I'll live for him who died for me, how happy then. My life shall be, I live for him who died for me, my Savior and my God. I now believe thou dost receive, for thou hast died that I might live, and thou henceforth I'll trust in thee, my Savior and my God. I'll live for him who died for me. How happy then my life shall be. I'll live for him who died for me, my Savior and my God.
Thou who died on Calvary to save my soul and make me free, I'll consecrate my life to Thee, my Savior and my God. I'll live for Him who died for me, be then my life shall be I live for him who died for me my Savior and my God Amen I just want to share one thing as we read this verse it says understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee. So he went over the Jordan before the people of Israel. We all know the story of this. this is, the, the Jordan River was overflowed its banks. And all of Israel standing there saying, how are we going to get over there? There's no bridge, no boats. How are we going to do this? And God said, well, you know what? If you'll go forward, put the priests, will take the Ark of the Covenant, and as soon as they go and their feet touch the water, it'll open up. But you know what? It wasn't the feet of the priests that opened the water. It was God going before them, and when he walked into that water, that water just went poof, right? The water got out of God's way, and he walked through, and that water just got out of the way and let all the people through. So sometimes you're going to be standing there on the brink of that water saying, I don't know how, how are we going to do this? If God's going in front of you, everything will get out of the way. Just follow him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're a God of truth and a God who cannot lie. We thank you, Lord, that nothing is impossible with you and all things are possible with you. And we thank you, Lord, that when there's obstacles in, in our way, we, if we follow you, you'll make a way. And that, Lord, everything will get out of your way when you're leading. Help us to trust you. Help us to believe you. Help us to put our feet forward in response to your promise and to watch you do great and mighty things which we know not. I pray you'd help us to be not only the receivers of grace, as we heard tonight, but also the granters of grace to those around us, that, Father, they might see Jesus in us and experience him in our hand. Lord, we just love you, praise you, and thank you for being so kind and gracious to us. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, turn your hymn books. We're going to sing number 796, one verse. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Amen. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shabbos dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made the darkness depart. Sing out. Heaven 